Okay. Linda's been traveling traveling across Australia in, in a van doing caravanning across Australia. So she so went from the East Coast to the West Coast, which is no small task, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's amazing. No, it's not. <laughs> I know. And roasting at 8 a.m. in the morning in, uh, in Western Australia. I remember those mornings. You wake up, you feel like your skin's going to burn off because yeah. it's so bloody hot. Yeah. And the, I'm surprised at the humidity over here, actually. It's um, the nights seem to be really sticky. And while there is a little bit of a breeze this morning, it's still hot. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. And that's my complaint for the day. <laughs> Good. That's the only one you get. That's the only one I'm getting. Yeah. The only one you're getting. Okay, V, let's uh let's rock and roll. Oh, did you want to give Katie a bit of background? Oh, yeah, yeah. So Katie, the background of, of the course <clears throat> is that it was, I may have said this to you, or I, I can't remember whether whether we discussed this or not. But the background of the course is that it was channel, it's a channeled work. Uh, mm -hmm. from actually a woman who was a Jewish atheist and uh, and she was a psychiatrist in a hospital and she made a commitment to her supervisor, a guy named Bill Thetford, who was you know my friend, the guy that I know, and that they would find a better way to assist people other than the antiquated methodologies of psycho uh, of psychoanalysis and psychiatry. And um, about three months later, she showed up in Bill's office and said, I think I'm going insane because I'm automatic writing. I can't stop. I get up in the middle of the night and I put pen to paper because I'm compelled to do it. I hear this voice in my head. It tells me what to write. I write everything down, it says. And then and I can't stop. And so he said, well, let me let me read it and see what see what's coming out of you. And so she let him read it. And he was like, you have to finish this. And about three years later, a book about that thick and 10 point font emerged and it was A Course of Miracles. And somewhere towards the beginning or in the semi middle of it, um, it is, you know, I am the Christ and I've come to clarify the distortions in my teachings. And when you read the course, um, it is it is if you're listening to um, an enlightened soul, it's not written with from a person with an ego, <clears throat> absolutely can't be. And it's written in such a way that it says the same thing repetitively throughout the course, but in different ways in order to unravel the, the conscious mind's interpretation from millions of people, because all of us are going to see it and interpret it a little bit differently. But the course says it's quite simplistic, but it says the same fundamental things. And um, and it's probably some of the most beautiful and most important literature in the last 2,000 years that's ever been written. Um, awesome. And pe people follow it from all over the world. Um, they've made a life of it. There's a study group. How many people are in the study group, V? Oh, this particular a one that we're running, there's 50 people in the Facebook group. And it's a, it's a, it's a daily practice group. Yes, I'm not doing daily it daily lesson. anymore. I'm giving people a bit of space to breathe with them because some of them are quite big, um, but it's more like probably two or three lessons a week now. Oh, uh, good, good. Because I found that the lessons are really big, and some of them take take more than just a day to try to practice them. So at the end of the Course in Miracles, Katie, there is a daily meditations. Um, and there's a Facebook group that uh, V started from this group um, that uh, you know helps people go through the daily lessons. So if you want to participate in that, um, you can just you know contact Veronica and V. If you could put your email in the um, in the chat, that would be awesome. Um, and I'll share screen now so we can start on the lessons. V. There we go. We're starting on wholeness and spirit, which sounds pretty interesting to me. Okay. And what we do, Katie, is each one of us reads a section out loud. But last week, we spent an hour on a, a paragraph about this big. So we'll see where we go. <laughs> okay. V, do you want to start, darling? Sure. 
The miracle is much like the body in that both are learning aids for facilitating a state in which they become unnecessary. When spirit's original state of direct communication is reached, neither the body nor the miracle serves any purpose. Shall I read the whole thing initially? Yeah, I think so, and then we'll break it down. While you believe you are in a body, however, you can choose between loveless and miraculous channels of expression. You can make an empty shell, but you cannot express nothing at all. You can wait, delay, paralyze yourself, or reduce your creativity almost to nothing, but you cannot abolish it. You cannot destroy your medium of communication, but not your potential. Well, you can destroy your medium of communication, but not your potential. You did not create yourself. Hmm. Okay. Shall we start at the top? Yeah. So okay. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you give it a go, V, and see see what you come out with? Okay. So the miracle is much like the body in that both are learning aids for facilitating a state in which they both become unnecessary. And for me, that comes back to the fact that, um, you know, this, uh, I don't even know who started, who said it initially, but um, we are, we are not a body with a soul. We are a soul with a body something like that um and our body is just the means of us to get around so that makes a lot of sense for me the body is you know we keep our body well and healthy so that we can do the best work we can but it's not who we are and i love that the miracle is much like the body and that both are learning aids for facilitating a state in which they become unnecessary which which says to me that that the miracle, as we know, is the ability to to look at another from the perspective of choosing to see their soul, not their personality, not their differences, not their not their covering or the vehicle their soul's riding around in, but to identify the soul, which then creates that sense of oneness, which is then what the course is calling the miracle. Miracle is much like um, the body in that both are learning aids for facilitating a state, which means that transcendent state that where when we are in that state of constantly seeing um, the creator in all things, then our bodies become unnecessary. And as does the miracle become unnecessary because we're connected to that that divine presence all the time. And then the next line, does anyone have, else have anything they want to say about that that first line or any questions about it? I don't think okay. so. Okay. Carly or Linda, you guys good? Mm. Okay. The next one is when spirit's original state of direct communication is reached, that's that's what remember when we were reading about the miracle and the um uh, revelation remember that like the miracle is you know continued miracles is seeing the, the just the lord and other people the the um what did i just call it be revelation <laughs> revelation thank you yes the revelation <laughs> the revelation i've been talking all day the revelation is that direct experience of um of just like the the essence of god like you're in that state all the time okay so when spirit's original state of direct communication is reached neither the body nor the miracle serves any purpose because you're already there the purpose of the body the purpose of 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 being able to see others through that lens loses its purpose because you're already there while you believe you are in a body, however, you can choose between loveless and miraculous channels of expression. So I think we all know that, that we've gone to, uh, to deep depths of despair and have been uh, and also have been in high levels of, um, of miraculous expression as well. You can make an empty shell but you cannot express nothing at all. 
So we can make ourselves as shut down and as dysfunctional if we were to using drugs and alcohol and over-sexualization, we'll make ourselves an empty shell. But you cannot express nothing at all. Whatever we do or not do is an expression of our life force. You can wait, delay, paralyze yourself, or reduce your creativity to almost um, your creativity almost to nothing, but you cannot abolish it. So we cannot abolish our own creative nature, our own spirit. You can destroy your medium of communication, which means the ability to see through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and see the soul of another person, but not your potential. You did not create yourself. Does anyone have any questions on this? Because I, for me, it's it's pretty clear. But does anyone have any questions or any comments? I still feel that you did not create yourself, but we are creating all the time. It says you cannot reduce your creativity. You you can reduce your creativity almost to nothing, but we are creating all the time, and that's where we're right. creating from, whether it be the loveless state or the miraculous state. I, I kind of love that 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 statement. Like you did not create yourself, meaning that something in the course's language would be something more divine created us. Therefore, we're a spark mm -hmm. of that, and that we can't destroy. We can destroy everything else, but we can't destroy that. Okay. Destroy our spark. That's right. So let's go to the next one. He's going to read that one. Carly? Um, yeah, I was just looking at Carly. She looks like the <laughs> next one. <leader. laughs> Give it a whirl. The basic decision of the miracle-minded is not to wait on time any longer than is necessary. Time can waste as well as be wasted. The miracle worker, therefore, accepts the time control factor gladly. He recognizes that every collapse of time brings everyone closer to the ultimate release from time, in which the Son and the Father are one. Equality does not imply Oh, equality does not imply equality now. When everyone recognizes that he has everything, individual contributions to the sonship will no longer be necessary. I'm going to have to read this a few times. Um, just for Katie's um, uh, benefit, the course is written... Um, uh, well, it's a little misogynistic, to tell you the truth, because it's always written in the he pronouns, you know, the sonship and the he. Um, so don't let that, you know, don't let that sway you. But it is um, the son and the sonship is really meant to just be the soul of God. Um, so but if we get caught up on gender stuff, it'll be confusing or annoying. <clears throat> Do you want to you want to read the first the first line and let's see if we can't break it down or Linda or Carly or if you want Katie you can jump in and 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 read part of it as well. Does anyone want to yeah, read? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, the basic decision of the miracle minded is not to wait on time any longer than is necessary. Read Do you the want me to go? Line. Yeah, okay. read read the next line. Time can waste as well as be wasted. The miracle worker therefore accepts the time control factor gladly. Now, I have a question about that. What's the time control factor? I do not know what that means. Time can waste. Well, there was a whole section before on um, time. Um, yeah, remind me. Called? But it was it was basically saying there is no time. It's an artificial concept, and it's up to us what we do with what we what we have here. 
it does remind me of something that I've read with Napoleon Hill, Thinking Grow Rich, and it's a few other things as well, where um, if, if you find that there is a decision that you've made in no time at all, then you need to take action in no time at all. You must take action straight away because it's what you're, you know, it's something that if you haven't had to think about it, then it's coming from your purpose and your, your sole reason for being here. Therefore, take action immediately. Yeah. That's what I'm kind of feeling from this. Miracle worker, therefore, accepts the time control factor gladly. What do you think they're speaking about, about the time control factor gladly, just that there is this illusion of time and we accept it gladly because of that is kind of the world we're living in, controlled yeah, by time? so in our 3D world, there is time to be considered and we need to be acting straight away, yeah. not just you know, doing our little meditation, okay. we need to be acting. That's what That I makes total sense. Okay, great. Kitty, you want to read uh, the next sentence too? He recognizes that every collapse of time brings everyone closer to the ultimate release from time in which the son and the father are one. He recognizes that every collapse of time brings everyone closer to the ultimate release from time. Oh, anybody want to comment on that? Elaborate on that? Okay. Again, I, I, I feel yeah. like that's it's because when we don't take action straight away on what is being channeled to us to do, procrastination comes in and we come up with excuses of not why we can't do things. This is talking for me personally. This is happens. This happens to me all the time. If I don't take action straight away, it's like, oh yeah, excuse, insert excuse here. And I don't do things. And that's the ego which comes up so much in here as well. That's the ego shutting well, down what's channeled absolutely i'll add another dimension to it he recognized that every collapse of time brings everyone closer to the ultimate release from time in which the son and the father are one so i i'm interpreting that the collapse of time <clears throat> means that when you're in that moment of inspiration when you feel because it doesn't happen all the time but the whole course is about how do we practice the presence of the creator in our lives moment by moment by moment? How do we, how do we do that? And I'm interpreting that as a collapse of time. Like I'm not separate. I'm like one in this moment in, in my experience. So that would be collapsing time. And that would also tie into in which the son and the father are one. So in that, that level of transcendence where you're not, you're not struggling to get someplace. You just feel like you're already arrived in that oneness. That would be the collapse of time in my mind. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? <clears throat> or did I confuse people with that? <laughs> Silence is deafening. <laughs> Well, I get I get that when I when I when I actually have a goal that I know will happen, and when you know it and believe it, and it, you just feel it in your body, it's like it has already happened. So when it does happen, it's no surprise. Whereas there's the goals that you set, which you struggle for and you strive for, and you really push yourself, and then you get there, and it's not quite what you wanted. <laughs> that, no, that makes yeah, but yeah, but time, you no. Know. I would, I would say too, um, just the way I interpret this as well is just going off of what you said, V, is when you are aligned with whatever you want to call it, spiritual, divine, however it is, what we're reading, um, and you are called to do something and you're in that alignment and you can already feel it, like, you're not sitting there waiting like if I had this or if I had that, I'm going to be happy when I do this and when I accomplish that because you're already going to feel that alignment, which is going to push you towards what you need to do and what you are here to accomplish and your purpose and your goal based off of the individual that created you. So therefore, time 
doesn't really hold any essence because you're already going to be feeling and acting out the things that need to be done in order for you to live out essentially your your purpose is kind of a way that I interpret it a little bit as well. No, that, that was that was great, Katie. Mm. Does actually, else Gary, I, I, I yeah, need to share. I need to share. Actually, one of those goals has happened. I, oh, I have go ahead. My, I have my first horse. I bought a horse. Mm. <laughs> you have your first horse. I do. Oh, that's awesome. Where where are you so, stapling it? Well, it was so easy because I just bought one from Wadi Farm, one that I connect with really well. And she's, you know, I work with her really well. And it's like, well, it's already there. So we'll just need to make it formal. Um, so so it's, it's a therapy horse then, right? Yeah, yeah. So she, she lives on the farm. And um, the deal is that she doesn't leave because... She's now bonded really closely again after being away from the farm for such a long time, for like nine years. She's rebonded with her mother and a half sister. So that and they're all greys and they just move together and it's so beautiful. Oh God, that's so great, V. That's amazing. Good for <laughs> you. Congratulations. And the, just again, saying, it's, you know? like, it's, it's just like this because you know, the ego's going, oh, let's have a look at all these websites where I can find horses from, and none of it felt right. And then I was just speaking to Catherine, um, the owner of the place, and um, I said, how about I just, why don't I just buy one of the horses here? And she says, who are you thinking of? I said, Rose. And she goes, yeah, let's do it. And it helps them out because it means that I'm, I, you know, I'm contributing to the costs for her and um, it's simple. I know. I know the horse. I know the owners. I know where she lives. I know her history, and um, we just connect really well. I went out there the other day, and I didn't even have a halter or anything, and I just said walk on, and she walked on with me, and I said back up, and she backed up, and she was just listening to me, without any kind of any kind of prodding or poking. She just listens to me. Oh God, that's yeah. wonderful. That is wonderful. <laughs> Um, I've done some equine work with uh, with a good friend of mine who is uh, a corporate trainer. And what she does is she does rope courses and, and equine work. And I come in and I do all the all the mindset stuff and the leadership stuff. And she does everything else. She has people standing on telephone poles. I'm like, you're never going to get me up on a telephone pole. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But yeah, it's awesome. I can't wait for you to. I can't wait to come down to Australia. You know, like you guys would be the one reason I'd want to come to Western Australia again. Like, I'm like, I never want to take that flight ever again in my entire life. But I think it would be really awesome to come down and, and spend it in Southwestern Australia, you know, like down in Margaret River and down that way in Nanup and stuff, because it's so stunningly beautiful down there. Plus, I would like to see flocks of emus and and giant red kangaroos would be good too. So, <laughs> be awesome. Okay, I I don't have any more questions about this. Does anyone else have any questions about this particular uh, section? Oh, I think there is one more thing. The last line. Katie, could you read the last line? Um. Wait, wait. Yeah, I believe we're at equality. Right? Is that where we left off? Yeah, um, yeah, we are. Equality does not imply equ equality does not imply equality now. When everyone recognizes that he has everything, individual contributions to the sonship will no longer be necessary. Wow. And you want to give a go at that? Can you just, can you explain the sonship? Yeah. The way I'm interpreting it, Katie, and that may evolve as we go through the course, but what I just interpret that is um, the, those souls who are, are in that state of, um, of that sense of oneness with God. Okay. And it could also be interpreted as every single living soul on the planet is part of the sonship, which includes 
every living thing. Um, but how I where I'm at right now, that's how how I would interpret it. Does anyone else have another facet to that interpretation other than what I just said? I do. I also take it as that you are the son is very um you're not just one of the children of God. You're you are the very important child of God. I like that, Carly. That's good. Yeah. yeah I, the son I, being like the firstborn son, you know, the, yeah, yeah. the if there was a hierarchy of the children, you're at the top mm. of it. Yeah, mm. I like that. What I love about this line says when everyone recognizes he has everything. And if you were to apply that to self. When, when you recognize that you have everything, what does that mean to you guys in individually? V, what does that mean to you? Like, if you were to recognize that you had everything, how would you, how would you like describe that? Um, I'm saying um, what you were talking about before, revisiting miracles versus revelation. For me, that means that there is no need for miracles anymore because I'm just in a state of revelation. I'm connected all the time to everything and everyone. And um, yeah, cool. Lady Linda, you got you have another interpretation or another facet to that? No. Okay. <laughs> I love you, darling. It's so good to see you. <laughs> it's just like so authentic. Uh, and, and Carly, do you have any other thing you want to add to that? Um, and I did. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so if you have everything, so we all do. We all have, you know, a roof over our head and food and everything. So it, the only thing that makes us think that we don't have everything is ego. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's that constant judging and, um, yeah, it's that constant judging and evaluating. Mm. I've been in deep observation of myself this week. Um, and it's been really interesting. Um to you know find myself scattered out and then pull back and realize that you know that literally there's no separation and then suddenly within like a span of five minutes boom everything's separate boom nothing separate boom everything's separate i start feeling like i feel like i'm like this pancake just being flipped you know trying to hold my focus on that on that there's only oneness. Has anyone experienced that, or am I just a little crazy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, B, you you're there Definitely. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just so curious. Um, okay. Uh, whenever re everyone recognizes he has everything, individual contributions to the sonship will no longer be necessary. I guess that's the objective. <clears throat> is to um, walk around feeling and experiencing that we have everything. Mm -hmm. I was at the gym today working out and uh, <laughs> and that was uh, what I was doing as I was running around the track. It's like in my, in my mind, I'm focusing on, I have so much grace on me. Like there's so much grace in my life and any worry that I would ever have that come up, that comes up into my mind to be just dispelled immediately, and um, and it's staying in that in that place because there's lots going on right now, which is great. But um, it's about staying in that in that space of no concern, just oneness, and things just fall into place. I did that for most of my time out of my office today. And I did, uh, you know, I've been I've been waiting for um, it's sort of a big opportunity to come. And so I, I come into my office, I click on on my emails, and there's this email from the um, the 
uh, personal assistant of a woman named Trisha Bin, and she is the CEO of an organization called the CEO Network, which is a nationwide network, a hub for chief executive officers to belong to and get supported. And so I was in Dallas a couple of days ago and I was in the recording studio and I was recording this podcast with the CEO of a group called Success North Dallas. And Trisha walked in because she was friends with a woman who was doing the podcast. And we just kind of talked. And I guess the woman that was doing the podcast called her up and said, you got to listen to this because I think you need to listen to it. And so I was, you know, I was on a rant, B, and you know how I can rant. <laughs> so I was on this rant about leadership. And uh, and this woman um, had her PA called me and say, and said, she has to have a meeting with you as soon as possible. She really needs to speak to you. And I'm like, that could only be really great news. Because if I can get into that C-suite network, <clears throat> there could be no better um advertising or networking that I could ever do. That would be like worth its weight in gold. So um, fingers crossed on that. I have that, I have that conversation next week, but it's almost like if you ever decide that there is something that you, you desire, but you haven't been able to manifest yet. I do believe it comes in as perfect time, but I also believe that it is about you calling it forward repetitively and declaring it repetitively to manifest before you or to manifest within your life. I think it's a twofold thing. Um, I personally think that we have the ability to collapse time between our destiny and now by our will, by our focus of mind. And um, so I kind of just more, I, I proved to myself today that that was um that was possible to do and i think it's important too to just when you're doing that like when you said i think we have the ability to shorten the time from something that we really desire in our lives based off the manifestation aspect and the way that we talk about it so yeah. i I used to follow Bob Proctor a lot and he talked a lot about just the way that you talk instead of saying, you know, this could be a great opportunity. It's just giving thanks that and acting as if that's already happened. Like I'm so happy and grateful now that I run, you know, all the trainings for the CEO network and this is what this has been able to do for my life. And just really like getting into your subconscious mind to believe that you already have established that because the neural waves that you essentially put out into the universe, I strongly believe will come back, you know, tenfold just based off of the way that you overall communicate that within yourself, whether it's you write it down every single day. And I think that has a lot to do as well with just, kind of this chapter about time. Like you don't have to waste the time. You just have to act as though you're already living the life yeah. that you dream to live up. So I think that's cool. No, it's very cool. And language is, you know, the birthplace of creation. So when we're mm -hmm. speaking, you know, our words, we're speaking like 70,000 words a day, internal dialogue, external speech. And every word is a birthplace of, of our future. So, you know, for me, uh, funny, because I, I, just, I just finished writing a chapter in my book all about manifestation and language being a key component of that manifestation. So it is, um, it's super important uh, to, to watch your words with care. As Buddha mm -hmm. said, watch your words with care and let it spring for concern for all living things. Because as a man speaks and thinks, so they become. Yeah. So that's awesome. <clears throat> hey, Linda, why don't you read the next one, darling? <clears throat> when the atonement has become completed, all talents will be shared by the sons of God. God is not partial. All his children have his total love, and all his gifts are freely given to everyone alike. 
accept ye become as little children means that unless you fully recognize your complete dis- dependence on God, you cannot know the real power of the Son in his true relationship with the Father. Shall I stop it there? Because it's a uh, half yeah. sentence. Yeah, yeah, I'll stop it there. Okay, who wants to give this a go? Who wants to define the the atonement? I have to keep looking back at what I actually wrote down for that <laughs> because it's still. I know I don't have my notes in front of me, so I'm hoping yeah. you're going to speak up, V. <laughs> yeah. So, um, for me, I just caught atonement means reconciliation or remembering who we are. Mm. You know, I, I have to say this because whenever I read something like when the atonement has been completed, all talents will be shared by all the sons of God, I would immediately default to, um, well, how's everybody going to wake up at the same time? Mm. Right? It's like people are not going to wake up at the same time. <laughs> They're just not going to do it. So, so how does that happen? And then um, what I, I've kind of come to was, was this idea, which I don't think is, is terribly well-formed, but I, I want to state it because I used to, when I first started studying the Course in Miracles, and it says, you know, you only walk hand in hand into heaven with your brothers and sisters. And I'm like, half the people I know I wouldn't want to hang out with, I certainly don't want to hold their hand and walk into heaven for eternity. It's like, I don't, you know, it's like, no, that's not going to happen in my world. And what I began to think is that's not what it means at all. It means that I stop judging, that I stop the evaluation of other people. And I, and it still comes back to this one thing and see them and see them as, as the creator, the, the, the light of God in each one, like it is in me. There's no difference between myself and another person, no matter what they look like, no matter what station of life they're in, the same spark of the divine is in them as it is me. Their life might be 180 degrees different than mine. Doesn't matter. And I keep thinking that when the atonement has been completed, meaning for me anyways, if I can see, if I can see life through that, that within me, the atonement is complete. And that means that, that all talents will be shared by all the sons of God. So when I'm able to extend that to, to, to everyone, to everyone that, that, that I meet, I create minor miracles. And mm-hmm. right now, it's like I sit back and I think if we all did that, there would be more and more atonement and eventually maybe everyone would get there. But I don't ever see logically how all the sons of God can complete the atonement at the same time. Does anyone want to have a comment on that or talk about that? Because this is something that I know in the Course of Miracles in the past has um, has given me pause. I don't think we all need to wake up at the same time. I don't think it takes everybody. Nor do I. I think we have to see everyone as awake inside of ourselves, and then that becomes our reality. What other people do in their own minds is something different, but if we wake up to it, we reach that atonement and contribute to the rest of, I think we just contribute to the rise of the vibration on, on, on the planet. That's so, that's my thought on it. Um, I also th- think what I'm thinking for myself is that um, as we wake up to it, then that gives us an opportunity too to help those who are next in line to wake up to it, if that makes any sense. So the more the more awakenment that there is, um, the more it means that we can help more people as they start to awaken. 
Yeah, I, I, w I would agree with you. Um, there's a there's a gentleman that lives on, on my street um, who's one of the kindest, sweetest people I've ever met. <clears throat> and um, he truly is genuinely living Christianity. And I'm, you know, I don't view Christianity like other people view Christianity. I think I think Jesus was an ascended master, and that's just what my belief system is. But um, he lives these principles. I've, I've never really quite met anyone like him. And uh, he really lives these principles. And um, every time um, we're together, it's like light bulbs are going on. And we just feel naturally happy in each other's <laughs> presence. And I can see how, you know, when we're able to do that, people will see that it's possible. And I believe that that's maybe what they're talking about here. Can yeah, you I think so. Oh, sorry. You no, I was, I was going to ask you, Katie, if you had any insight. Yeah, I just think, like, the way I interpreted it was, I almost feel as though, like, yes, we obviously know we didn't create ourselves. <laughs> like, we all are here to, um, you know, live out the way I look at it currently is we're all here to live out a purpose. And there are things in our daily lives every single day that essentially test us from God or your you know own definition of who God is purpose for your life. And when you get to the point of really understanding that you don't have to suffer anymore with the decisions that maybe you have been making based off of the selfishness of yourself, essentially, that at that point, you will be praised and shared, like your talents will be shared. And also, like you had mentioned, Gary, things will start to things and people it will start to naturally attract themselves to you because i truly believe that like you mentioned with your neighbor <clears throat> positive energy is very powerful we all know that and you start to you know be essentially that living beaker of light for those around you which in turn can help inspire and help you know, just the people around you to see that also that it's possible, but that you don't like you don't have to continue to suffer with whatever you may currently be doing. Some people, unfortunately, don't even know the definition of their, you know, suffering. They just wake up every morning with anxiety and depression and alcoholism and drugs and things like that. But one day when you realize that time to let those things go and have God live within you and live out their purpose that all of that will essentially go away and because of that you will truly live your life in happiness and fulfillment on a daily basis well that is definitely the, the objective and I do think that um, when each one of us wakes up to being more connected in that sacred moment uh, to source and we're able to stay there, when our vibration literally rises, our light does get bigger and people feel it in your presence. And that does act as an inspiration for other people. Yeah. So I think it's totally possible. Be the light. Okay. Say mm -hmm. again? Yeah. Be the light. <laughs> the simple form. <laughs> Be the light. light, allow others to um to have their own light. light yeah, light. I I don't think there's there's any other way. You know, I I sincerely don't. And uh, I mean, there's it's interesting because what was it? <laughs> Robert was um Robert was at the grocery store down the street getting some bananas or something for breakfast, and uh, and. Uh, it's very uh what's the word it's very old school christianity there's because we're in arkansas right and so you know he's at the he's at the store and there's this old guy at the register going because the villages are kind of this protected community that i'm living in right now 
And he goes, you know, there's like drug addicts moving into the village and we have to, we have to stop this right now. And, and I'm, and he was like, okay, yeah, good. And he goes, I need you to go home and pray about this because that's going to be the only way these drug addicts are going to stop coming to our, our village. And, I, and Robert's like, <laughs> he's like, I don't think Mary's going to quite get it. You know? but this old guy is like really into it. It's like, all you got to do is pray and Jesus, Jesus will save us all, you know, which, you know, uh, the right form of Christ doing this, um, seeing the atonement and seeing all that and trying to actually help people may have an impact. Um, but, you know, I think it's, I think it's really important that we just let people be how they need to be in that moment and see the light of God in them without evaluating their, their faith, their approach, where they are at this moment. I've done my very best to not judge people and, um, and to be able to say wherever they are in their spiritual evolution and whatever they're finding love for God in whatever form that is, whatever religion that is, whether it's walking in the woods or being in a church or whatever it is, that's perfect for them at this time. Yeah, and I think, too, like it is so important because I think about this often with, like you mentioned, drug addicts and you know, like I've had friends and family members that have struggled with addiction. And the last thing that individuals who are already feeling down and out about themselves want is somebody coming to them and lecturing them as to why they shouldn't be doing that. Like, you know, like, and that's just my own personal take. I feel like it's just always your approach, like just be there for those individuals, let them know that, you know, they can always reach out to you and you're not going to judge them. And yeah, you can definitely send them positive vibes and energy and prayer, but it's also about the approach because people are just going to essentially put up a wall to the individuals that they do feel judged by and that Absolutely. will create a form of separation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Do we want to go to the next one? <clears throat> or are we done with this? Is there more mm -hmm. that, that we need to read on this? <clears throat> Anyone How have a vote on that? To, I, think, I don't know. How far do we get to reading this through? I don't think very far. Mm. So... I'm, I'm just going to complete it. Um, God is not partial. All his children have his total love and all his gifts are freely given to everyone alike. Except you become as little children means that unless you fully recognize your complete dependence on God, you cannot know the real power of the son in his true relationship with the father. I have a question. How how many of us on the call has ever felt like just a complete surrender? Like I either I can't do it, I don't know how to do it, but we completely surrender over. Has anyone on the call experienced that before? Do you mean as in as in knowing? Or feeling that you can't do it, so surrendering it to it in the way that oh, well, I'm just going to do it anyway and see what the outcome is. Yeah, is and mean? actually, yeah, that's exactly what what I mean. It's almost like God just guide me, you know, like whatever this is. My mind can't figure it out. The whatever the the pieces of the puzzle that need to be put in place, as I think it should be put in place for me to accomplish this. I don't know how to do this. I can't do it. Um, so I'm surrendering this over to you and either manifest it or don't manifest it for me. I've I've done this several times where I've just said, this is what I would like. <laughs> this is what I want to create. But what I really want is for me to be closer to you. And I think that was a key for me and why it manifested 
I just said, whatever comes next, I wanted to bring have it bring me closer to you. And um, and it manifested within four hours of what I was asking for, like four hours with the most incredible manifestation of what I was asking. Um, and it happened in four hours. And boy, did it send me for a loop. And I mean, I was asking for spiritual evolution. That was when I entered therapy. <laughs> yeah, it was it was uh, it was a big deal. I asked for a relationship. And it happened in like four hours. And um, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And it was a beautiful relationship, but it was the most confronting and painful thing I've ever been through because I had never done work on myself at that time. I was literally a dumpster fire. And, uh, and my partner at the time um, was was very um what's the word grounded very solid and i was not and i just squirmed like a snake under a tire wheel for seven years um and it was the absolutely most perfect thing that i ever i couldn't have designed it better because it was because of him that i actually started teaching and training and teaching seminars because i was in so much pain from us breaking up uh, I was so brokenhearted that I um, I decided that I had to, to teach about relationships because I didn't know anything about them and I wanted to be successful in them. And I, I started. And so it was a, it was a really, really powerful thing when you when you feel like you ask for spiritual evolution, you ask for more experience of God and to remove the blockages between yourself and it whatever it is, your, your, your connection to it. And when you ask for it and you completely surrender, it manifests very quickly. But it doesn't mean you're going to be comfortable, especially if you're asking for spiritual evolution. It means you have to face everything that's blocked you from it. And that becomes, um, that becomes quite an experience. V, what was your time that you surrendered? Because you were nodding your head that you had done that. It was buying the horse. It was, <laughs> like, it was just I love like, that. Like, making this so complicated, like looking at all these websites and trying to work out all these intellectual things that I need to work out how to buy a horse and what I need to, what I need to put in place. And it's every time I do a goal and I go, every time I sit down that I write a goal and I'm starting to think of hows, how am I going to get there? That stops me in my tracks. When I surrender, I don't worry about the how anymore because it's when? going to get revealed as I step along the path towards it. Well, for me tonight, the most um, the most powerful uh, most powerful line in that we've read for me is like this whole thing about being like a, like a child being totally dependent on this complete dependency on God. And I think that that is, um, and that's not like a cop out. That means like, it's not like you, you, you don't strive. You don't have goals. You don't work towards things. It means that you surrender over the results. Like mm -hmm. go out there, do your very best effort, but you surrender over the results. It's, it's in your hands. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to put out everything that I know to do. And it's in your hands. Manifest it or not. Bring to me that which is going to draw me closer to you. And then I think that there is um, there's an act that um, has always worked for me previously. And this really reminded me of that. Does anyone else have anything they want to share about the that those last couple lines? Okay. Um we're almost at straight up at 758. So Katie, what we do at this time is we give um well, I'd like to kind of morph it a little bit. What is the one thing you're going to take from the readings tonight and practice throughout the week? 
what is that one thing? So V, would you like to start or do you need more time to think about it? Uh, I got lots of things, but I um, what's popping out is be the light. Sweet. <laughs> Mine is to recognize um, my dependence on surrendering over to a higher power. Linda? Um, yes, it is continue to allow the manifestation. Harley? See the love in the others. Katie? Mine is going to be similar to yours, Gary. I'm just going to continue to see just like the small prayers and essentially what can be done in the course of a week by surrendering the things that no longer serve a purpose in my life. Awesome. I, I always like to leave that caveat. If this brings me closer to you, bring it to me. If it takes me further away from you, take it away. Mm -hmm. And that that always seems to to work in my, my world um so i'll just offer that up that may work for you or or not but um i know i, I guess this one thing always comes to me um because i i've i've worked with so much death and dying that i know that we're all going to face that point where we we have to surrender over our bodies and we have to jump into the void of the unknown and if we haven't built a relationship or a practice of surrendering over to a higher power and built that 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 storehouse of experience that yes there is something on the other side that's guiding us that's operating in our lives um we won't be real happy at the point of death we'll be a little terrified i personally know that that is an inevitability and I want to be practicing and have experiences that I go, oh, yeah, when I surrender over, this happened, this happened, and this happened. So it's about building up that reservoir of faith and knowledge about my, um, my experience with whatever this creative force is. Because it's, it's a mystery, it's powerful, it's ever-present and I want an intimate relationship with it while I'm living in this body. So I have an intimate relationship with it at the time of my death. Mm -hmm. So gang, I am signing off. I have clients I still need to facilitate tonight. So I'm going to thank every one of you for coming. Lynn, it's always good to see you, Carly. Oh, by the way, Katie, we have someone famous on the call. She doesn't think she is, but she's famous in my eyes because she was a seamstress that made Legolas's leather outfits for the Lord of the Rings. You know, the elf that was with all the guys. Oh, and stuff. Yeah, and Carly worked on that project and was the, the seamstress for, um, my, what's his name? Orlando Bloom, yeah. That's awesome. Well, I would take it you are very talented then. Yes, he is. Is he as cute as he looks? Yeah. That's weird, though, but when you see him and, you know, with all his short, dark hair and you, yeah, and the long blonde hair thing, that's all weird. <laughs> well, I really liked his long white hair. I mean, he's so elfin, you know. <laughs> I know. That's funny. I know. Goodness. Okay, well, gang. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me on here. I look oh, forward to continuing to learning with you weekly. So, thank you so much. That'd be awesome, Katie. It, it's very informal. We're all throwing in our two cents because none of us know everything. So, we just add dimensions to it. And, yep. V, congratulations on your miracle and your beautiful horse. What are you going to name her? Well, she's she's already got her name. She's thirteen. She's her name's Rose, which is ironic because that's my sister's name. Aww. 
But, but the, basically the horses there, even though they're rescue horses from stations, they're actually whalers, which is a breed of horse that was the Australian war horse, the ones they sent off to World War One and, and South Africa and wherever else they went. So um, they're a very, very strong breed, very um, genetically very strong because they've got a good mix. Um, and they named their horses after um, like war heroes and stuff. So she's actually Agent Rose. Nice. That's amazing. Yeah. Nice. So I just wish her incredible longevity. So you have her for years to come. Mm -hmm. And uh she's a blessing in your life. And one of those uh <clears throat> one of those mini myriad um iterations of God that shows up and communicates with you on a level that is not not verbal, but straight from the heart. And that's what horses do. So I'm happy for you, V. Thank you. <laughs> okay, gang, have a great night. We'll see you later. See you next Tuesday. Take care. Bye. Bye.